Hey guys, what's up? It's Danny. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a study with me where we are going to be reviewing pretty much everything about the shoulder. I have a really, really, really important exam on the shoulder coming up. And instead of sitting alone on my computer for hours, I decided, you know what? Let me make this video. That way I can review the information with you guys and hopefully we can learn something together. If this is the first time that you're watching one of my videos, what's up? My name is Danny. I'm currently an athletic training student at the University of Miami. My channel mainly focuses on my life as a college college student, but I am trying to incorporate more athletic training and sports medicine content, so make sure you hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with my weekly uploads. Anyways guys, let's go straight into it and talk about the shoulder. In this video, I'm going to be covering the basics of everything from bony anatomy to muscles to sport injuries because that is what I am going to be tested on. I like to go over bony anatomy first because if you know where your bones and landmarks are, then you know where your muscles originate an inch or two and it just makes it really easy when it comes to learning all these injuries. To review the bones, I have my friend, the one and only. I actually don't have a name for this thing. So if you guys have any name suggestions, just drop them below in the comment section. But let's take a closer look at the bones of the shoulder. Let's start off anteriorly with this flat chest bone we have known as the sternum. The upper portion of the sternum is known as the manubrium and it articulates with the medial clavicle to create the sternoclavicular joint. As we move laterally, the clavicle articulates with the acromium to create the acromioclavicular joint. The acromium process is this bump right here that's on the tip of your shoulder. Inferior to the acromium, we have the head of the humerus meeting the glenoid fossa creating the glenohumeral joint. On the humerus itself, medially we're going to have the lesser tubercle and laterally we're going to have the greater tubercle which serve as attachment points for major muscles. In between the tubercles, we have another space where muscles run through known as the bicipital groove or the intertubecular groove. Medially to the humerus, we're gonna have this bump right here known as the coracoid process. And then right below it, we're gonna have the origin for one of the main internal rotators of the shoulder, which is a subscapular fossa. As we move posteriorly, we can see here that the ribs meet the scapula, and this is known as the scapular thoracic articulation. The superior medial tip of the scapula is known as the superior angle. In this space, next to the superior angle, we're gonna have the supraspinatus fossa, which is where your supraspinatus originates. This ridge that runs medial to lateral is known as the scapular spine and right below it we're going to have the origin for the infraspinatus which is the infraspinatus fossa lastly we have the lateral border of the scapula and the medial border of the scapula and the inferior angle now that we know everything about the bones it is time to throw this thing out Ooh. Now that we know our bones and landmarks, let's take a look at the muscles of the shoulder. Don't worry guys, I'll put this away. I know, I know, I'm not that big yet. When it comes to learning and memorizing muscles, I think it's really easy to learn them if you like group them into sections. So the first set of muscles that we're gonna be taking a look at are our rotator cuff muscles. Anteriorly, we're gonna have the subscapularis, which is the main internal rotator out of all the rotator cuffs. As we move superiorly, we're gonna have the supraspinatus, which is responsible for abduction. Inferior to that, we're gonna have the infraspinatus, which is mainly responsible for external rotation, but it does carry out some adduction and abduction. Lastly, we're gonna have the teres minor, which is responsible for external rotation, adduction, and retroversion. Next up, we're going to have the muscles of the chest. The largest chest muscle is the pectoralis major, which is responsible for flexion, extension, adduction, internal rotation, and protraction. Then we have the pectoralis minor, which mainly assists the pectoralis major and performs protraction. So we have two muscle groups reviewed. We are halfway there. The next muscle group we're going to go into are the muscles of the upper arm. Let's start off with the biceps brachii, which is responsible for flexion and supination. A very deep muscle we have, which is one of the strongest flexors, is the brachialis. Next, we have the coracobrachialis, which is responsible for flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Then we have the deltoid, which has three different heads. The anterior head is responsible for internal rotation, adduction, and enteroversion. The lateral head is responsible for abduction, and the posterior head is responsible for external rotation, adduction, and retroversion. Then lastly, we have the tricep brachii, which is responsible for extension. Now the last set of muscles, which in my opinion are the hardest to memorize, just because they have a lot of origin insertions and different actions, are the muscles of the back and neck. 
One of the major back muscles is the trapezius, which is responsible for neck flexion, extension, and rotation, but it also performs retraction. Then we have the latissimus dorsi, which performs flexion, extension, and adduction. The muscle located within the ribs is the serratus anterior, and its main action is protraction. We have the rhomboid major and minor, which retracts the back and scapula. Originating from the scapula, we have the teres major, which performs adduction, internal rotation, and retroversion. Superiorly, we have the levator scapulae, which as the name suggests, performs elevation of the scapula. Lastly, we have the sternocleidomastoid, which is responsible for neck flexion, extension, and neck rotation. We know our bones, our muscles, but now it's time to learn how all these different structures get injured and all the injuries to the shoulder. I have my computer right there. I like writing up all my notes on OneNote, so let's head over to the computer. All right, so I have my notes here. I have a piece of paper here so I could like test myself and see if I actually know everything. There are two sections of injuries on my notes that I have to go over. It's a good amount of injuries, so let's get started. Alright, so I just went over the first part which covered a lot of different injuries. The first thing I'm going to talk about are two different shoulder deformities. First off, we have scapular winging which is when your scapula protrudes out and posterior. This is caused by things like muscle weakness or imbalances, nerve injuries, or it's just congenital but you never really do anything to make it better so it just becomes a really big deformity. Next up we have Sprangles deformity which is when one side of the scapula doesn't develop properly and as you guys can see right here like one scapula sits higher than the other side. Obviously, this is gonna lead to things like decreased range of motion, muscle imbalances, and it can also predispose you to other injuries. Next up, we have shoulder contusions, which is pretty much a bruise on the shoulder. This basically happens by falling right over the shoulder or getting hit directly with a lot of force. Now, a common sprain that can happen in the shoulder is an AC joint sprain. This happens when you have a really hard fall or a really strong hit right over the acromioclavicular joint, causing damages to the ligaments. Depending on the grade of the sprain, different ligaments will be damaged and you may also see a really big deformity. Another sprain that we have is a sternoclavicular joint sprain, which again happens by getting directly hit right here in the SC joint. Typically, the sternoclavicular joint is pretty stable. Now, the only issue with this injury is that if you do get hit really, really hard, the clavicle might fall posteriorly, which can be dangerous because it could damage your trachea, can affect your breathing, and it could become a medical emergency. Moving on to some muscle injuries, we have strains and ruptures. A really good example for this is like if you're in the gym, you're trying to get really, really big, but you're doing a way too heavy weight and you like do an over contraction, you can actually rupture your pectoralis major. And same thing goes for the bicep. If you're like overloading your arms with too much weight and you just do a really strong flex contraction, it could lead to a bicep rupture. Moving on to some bone injuries, we have a clavicular fracture. If you fall like really hard on your shoulder or just have a really strong force go through your shoulder, it could cause your clavicle to fracture. Another type of fracture is a fracture to the humerus, which can happen when you fall on an outstretched arm. So pretty much you fall like this with an arm straight and then pa, your humerus gets fractured. Typically, we see fractures more in an older population just because of all the bone decay over time. However, there is a condition known as Little League Shoulder or Proximal Humeral Growth Plate Fracture, which as the name implies, it's a fracture to the proximal growth plate of the humerus. This is mainly seen in younger overhead athletes who start developing pain when they throw. Now let's talk about some nerve injuries that can happen around the shoulder, and one of the most important ones is Thoracic Outlet Syndrome. Thoracic Outlet Syndrome is an abnormal compression of the structures between the cervical spine spine and the axilla or the armpit. It mainly causes compression to the subclavian artery, which means a decreased pulse, but it also compresses the brachial plexus. And if you don't know what the brachial plexus is, it's pretty much a network of nerves that are like right here around your armpit and kind of like transmit out to the rest of the upper body. All right, so I know that was a lot, but we still have one more section to go. Let me just go over the notes. Hopefully I memorize them really fast and we can review this together.
right, so section number two of notes is done. Let's start talking about shoulder dislocations. So first off, we have an anterior dislocation, which happens when your arm is abducted and externally rotated, but you also have a posterior and lateral force. When this happens, the head of the humerus falls and it comes out of the socket that it has on the glenoid fossa. This can also lead to secondary injuries like a bank art lesion, which is when the anterior portion of the labrum detaches from the glenoid rim, or a hill sax lesion, which is when the posterior articular surface of the humerus gets fractured due to contact with the scapula. The next type of dislocation we have is a posterior dislocation. A posterior dislocation happens when your arms are flexed like this, like if you're an O-line or a D-line, and you have a posterior force driving through the humerus and the shoulder, which causes the dislocation to happen posteriorly. Then lastly, we have an inferior dislocation, which is not too common. This dislocation happens when you have your arm abducted and you have stress applied to the joint capsule. Now, the next set of injuries are really common in overhead athletes like baseball players. What happens with overhead athletes like baseball players is that they go through an excessive amount of abduction and external rotation so that the ball can reach a high velocity. This can lead to things like glenohumeral internal rotation deficit or GERD, which is caused by having tight muscles, not allowing you to have your full internal rotation capability. And all that constant overuse of your rotator cuff muscles can lead to a rotator cuff strain or tear. Now, the last injury I'm going to be talking about is a slap lesion, which pretty much stands for superior labrum anterior posterior. The labrum is a cartilage structure within the joint, which helps stabilize the shoulder. From an anatomy perspective, it's also important to keep in mind that the long head of the bicep also goes through the labrum. This is important because depending on the labral tear, the long head of the bicep might also tear away with it. This really happens through overuse and just excessive range of motion and like a lot of throwing. Now, depending on how severe the tear is, you could treat it non-operatively or you might need surgery. All right, guys, those were pretty much all the injuries for the shoulder. But guys, hopefully you like enjoyed this video or like got something out of it. For me, it's interesting to do these videos because I like study, but I also do a video. So it's kind of like a two in one deal. If you guys enjoyed this video or found it useful, make sure to give it a thumbs up down below and subscribe to my channel to stay up to date with my weekly uploads. That is pretty much it for me, but always remember to stay hydrated.